Um, hello and welcome to um, the Quagmire. In this episode, we are going to talk about psychedelics. And before we start, um, I want to say we do not condone the use of psychedelics. This video is for educational purposes um, solely, and <clears throat> we do not intend to promote the use and distribution of psychedelics. Viewer discussion is advised. So we have Rob on the show. Hey, Rob. Um, <clears throat> tell us a bit about um, your experiences with psychedelics. Uh, well, hi, I'm Rob. Uh, um, I've done a few psychedelics. I've, I've done them a few times. Uh, um, not as often as some people who haven't done them might assume. I think a lot of people um, would assume that it, it's like some sort of drug habit where mm -hmm. you're going to be doing it all the time. Yeah. But I could probably count the amount of times I've done them on my hands. I don't actually know, but... No. Uh, and not more than 10 certainly not. you know and i've been doing them over like three years so it, it's not a regular thing but no. uh i i think it's very important and i think a lot of other people think it too and i think it's it's coming out about mm. how important it is um I'll wait on that a bit because i think there's studies based on how like you know mushrooms and lsd help are good as a tool for therapy mm -hmm. or depression like can you elaborate mm -hmm. on that or not yeah. And have you had any experiences? Yeah, of course. Like that? Uh, I've not had any experiences with what they're now calling psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. I've, I've not, I've not had anything like that. Um, but that's what is coming out, and and they are, that's what they're they're trying to do. Uh, I, if I remember his name, his name's Robin Cart Harris, but don't quote me on that. I, his first name is Robin. He, he, he's, um, he's the guy heading over the research at Imperial College London, and they're essentially trying to replicate or have successfully replicated um, original research, which was done by a man called Roland Griffiths, who um, found unprecedented results with treatment, with psilocybin being used to treat people who have addiction, smoking addiction, treatment resistant smoking addiction, and treatment resisted uh, clinical diagnoses of depression. So what Roland Griffiths originally found and what Robin Cart Harris has since repeated and others too, uh, although I wouldn't be able to say their names of their institution, but what they've since found was that when it came to people who had clin uh, treatment, re treatment resistant clinical depression, these are people that had like been diagnosed with terminal cancer um, and were very depressed about that situation. Um, treatment resistantly so when they were given a single dose of psilocybin um which is the compound in magic mushrooms uh like something like and this is a rough figure uh, uh, so don't quote me but you can look up the research it's public something like 80 percent of people from a single dose uh after six months or after three months uh showed no signs of regression and then something like a 60% after six months showed no signs of regression. And this is after a single dose, which is absolutely insane. And the same sort of statistics are roundabout true for um, smoking cessation too, for, for treating smoking addiction. Um, and I think just one last point, sorry. I think what Robin Cart Harris is now doing in Imperial Col College London, he replicated those two. So addiction and depression. And I think he's also now, uh, well, I believe he's also now using it to treat PTSD as well and other things like that. Yeah. It's not, they're not addressing the, these illnesses on like a physiological level. It's a, it's a psychological thing that's happening, isn't uh -huh. it, when you take these drugs? So what do you think that it is that about these drugs that's causing these huge changes? Well, um, it's, it's documented in the literature that the thing that, or the, ex the experience itself as an experience is what causes the trip. And they use the particular words, the mystical experience. And some have even said that, or it's, it's documented that those that don't have the mystical experience, quote unquote, do not get the positive results. So you'd see that it was like 80% with Roland Griffith study um, that let's take the cancer uh, diagnosis the diagnosis of depression from having terminal cancer let's take that study the 80 percent that got the beneficial results had a mystical experience and the 20 percent that didn't get the results didn't have a mystical experience um 
and they're quite uh they're researchers so they want to get their research published so as you can imagine they don't spend too much time talking about the mystical experience and why that's important but we're philosophers here so i think <laughs> that the yeah. mystical experience is important um even is the, even it's a great question um the mystic experience has been is a mystic would tell you the pro one of the prime or the primary experience of human existence it's the mysticism in general is the belief that a union with the absolute god or the universe is achievable through self-surrender or self-effacement because you get some mystics that like to like punish themselves but you get some mystics that just like to meditate and sort of chill out all the time um but that's the, that's the benefit of mysticism and psychedelics what they do is they uh, dissolve your ego. It's it in the in the pop popular culture. It's now called an ego death. But in scientific terminology, it's where the default mode network, which is like they think it's in the prefrontal cortex mainly. It's the area of your brain that's responsible for rational thought, um, self identification, things like that. That gets turned off in a psychedelic experience. So it's an ego death. And what that really is, is what the mystics have been talking about since mm -hmm. time, since, since humans are talking about anything, which is the union with God or the union with the universe um, through self-surrender or in this case, a drug-induced self-dissolution. <laughs> but yeah. Like, something, I feel about the, something I feel about the ego is... is sorry, how I feel, can't give up. But, um, something I feel about the ego is... um. It's kind of like a super hard, like titanium skin. Yes, it can be used to um, oncoming attacks to, like you know, the self consciousness, the um, uh -huh. your self worth. Um, it can very much defend against it. But mm -hmm. if there's something deep down in the internal organs, aka the subconscious, um, you can't mm -hmm. really get into it. You can't really solve it if you have such a rock hard, like you know, skin. If you get what I'm saying. So I feel psychedelics yeah. kind of like dissolve that, you know titanium skin and help you you know access this like the subconscious when let's say you yeah well by your ego you, you literally can't access it you may seem very healthy but there's stuff bobbling down that you're not really sorting mm -hmm. out yeah exactly um we could use uh Jungian terms to describe the psychedelic experience Jungian term um but first i just wanted to say the ego is not is not a bad thing, and, no. and the mystics would even tell you that the ego is not a bad thing. It, it, union with God is definitely a good thing, mm -hmm. and ego death is definitely a good thing. But ego consciousness is your everyday existence, and that is not a bad thing. Um, in fact, evolutionarily, it's probably a defense mechanism, as you say. Mm -hmm. it, it's it, it, it's very useful to identify for self because then I know who to feed. You know, I I, I know who I know. Uh, if I'm identified me, I know not to hurt this body. So that's pretty handy. It's a pretty cool trick. But um, we could use Jungian terms to talk about the subconscious. And because if you let, if you just live in an ego consciousness and you're not aware of your subconscious mind, Jung would say that um, the psychologist Jung, for people who don't know, is a psychologist in the 20th century. He um, he would say that if you are unaware of your subconscious motivations, desires, fears, that these will then dominate your conscious decisions, but you just won't know about it. So if you're scared of things, you will avoid things. You just won't know about it. Or if you're sexually motivated towards things, you'll pursue those things, but you won't be aware of it. And that's arguably way more dangerous. I mean, if you're, if you're, a, if you're a rampant pervert and you don't know about it, that's not a good thing, you know, or a, or a whatever. Um, so getting in touch with your subconscious desires, motivations, fears, and things like that. I mean, it's, it's got to be a good thing, hasn't it? Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. some people, it might not be though. Like some people, they might get extremely scared by the psychedelic experience and it can mm -hmm. fuck some people up. Like, I think I've heard not many people, it's quite rare, but I have heard stories of you know, people getting proper, like yeah. just messed up by yeah. they're not ready for a dive into the subconscious like i would never recommend giving acid to like a kid let's say or someone whose brain nah. is completely developed or i mean or isn't even close yeah to like 
I feel then it could really have some, you know, negative effects. But on the whole, I feel the dive into the subconscious is needed once in a while, at least. Like, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Um... It's a very interesting point. Yeah, hundred percent. And it, it's such an interesting point um, to say that some people could have an awful time. Um, and this is why, uh, in the beginning, in the '60s, when they were when they when the psychedelics, because they they never used to be illegal, and there was kind of a craze. It was called the Summer of Love. Some people might all be aware of it. Some people might not. But there was a a lot of this going around and what this was was a statement that essentially anyone could do it and everyone should do it and i've been partial to think that in the past but it's uh, while it may be true to some degree it is not responsible to say something like that and what is more responsible is what someone like robin is doing at imperial college london which they're now really taking seriously psychedelic assistant psychotherapy so it's not that everyone should do it um to treat to self-treat their problems and self and 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 to buy themselves in one night figure out all of their problems it's now what they're doing is they're using it in the, in a psychotherapy session which is guided and what they essentially do really is put some music on give you a blindfold and are there if you need any help they don't actually get in the way or anything like that but they they're allowing people to do it in a fantastic environment that's not going to that's going to reduce the chances of them having a bad trip and things like that so that's a much more responsible way of using these things um yeah <laughs> i had a question about the this mystical experience because i think it seems like that mystical experience is quite important to you and that you put a lot mm -hmm. of value on it and i was just wondering yeah. how you interpret that because like when you say that everything is one or that we're one with god or something yep. like that like could you just elaborate on what you mean by that because ordinarily people think that so like in the ordinary world view there's a physical world of matter and we are like physical bodies and our minds are produced by by our brains and stuff like that and so when you say everything is one and we are one with god what exactly yep. do you mean well so first it's best off to 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 say the common the the or the mainstream thought now which is as you said it's materialism it's it's um it's that we are bodies made up of matter and consciousness is a, is a product of that. Somehow our, mat our atoms are arranged into cells which are arranged in a particular way in our brains, particularly, which creates consciousness in some way. And that's, in a, that's the belief now. It is a belief, though. Um, there's just as much evidence for that as there is for the, for the evidence being consciousness pervades everything the thing is is that there's not really any evidence for both hard evidence anyway there's plenty of anecdotal evidence for the latter i'd say so to to what i think i mean and what a lot of mystics mean because they're all kind of saying the same thing they just have different metaphor a christian mystic would say that you are unified with god and they'd mean the christian god um Hindus would, would say something else, Buddha something else, etc. Um, but what they're all really saying in, if I was to use my terminology, which I only use because I think it's accessible when I try and talk about it, is that call it the universe. And, and if there's multiple universes, well, then I don't mean one universe. I mean everything when I say the word universe. The universe, the existence, yeah, yeah, you are a part of that existence. Yes. You just self-identify right now, um, but you are a part of existence. Um, and so when you take a psychedelic, the self-identification part just stops. And instead you identify with everything else, which is what you, you really are a part of everything else. There, there is no, and even if you wanted to, take an electronic microscope and go deep down there is no lines between you and the outside world there's no dividing borders or anything like that i mean good luck trying to find it so um that's essentially what what uh, mysticism is about it's, it's about it's it's about ex an experience because it's an experience of being unified with the universe um through so, just 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 by not identifying sorry yeah 
You mentioned before, you said um, there's just as much evidence to suggest that consciousness pervades everything as there is to suggest that consciousness is produced by the brain. So that's panpsychism, isn't it? That there's a, uh -huh. there's a physical universe and then consciousness is like a pervasive field mm -hmm. throughout this universe. So is what yes. you're saying that the, your consciousness and mm -hmm. this universal consciousness is the same yeah. thing and therefore you are one with God, God be in this infinite consciousness. Yeah. Uh, why, why not? I wouldn't amend anything that, that yeah. Um, it's essentially, and I, I don't think it's me who's saying it anyway. I, I'm just a, a guy. Uh, uh, <laughs> I've just... Uh, you're, you're, taken... you're infinite consciousness, aren't you? <laughs> Pardon? You're, in, you're, in, you're one with God, you're infinite consciousness. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but what I what I mean is when it, I'm I'm not the authority to say. I'm I'm just a, you know, I'm just a guy who's taken some substances. I, I, uh, but, uh, read some books. But um, yes, I would say that it's a, a panpsychism is the word now, and it's kind of coming into trend, isn't it? It's it, uh, it, materialism. Uh, maybe I'm optimistic, but materialism or reductionist materialism as a philosophy does seem to be losing favor in the mainstream views and maybe i am uh idealistic and maybe i just want that to be the case but panpsychism does seem to be taking over and um, and it just seems to be if we talk about it philosophically um because pa uh, ma mainstream philosophical materialism just has so many problems it can't explain so many things uh, it's it's frankly taken a long time for people to sort of see that and be like, hang on a minute, you can't even explain why things are conscious. You can't even really explain how they're conscious either. You can, like, that's the whole hard problems of consciousness, isn't it? You can sort of point at areas of the brain and say that they light up in certain situations, so it's somehow related. You can't say how or why. Um, and that's just because I don't think it can be explained materially. And it's it, a panpsychist sort of approach just seems a bit more sensible really even though it might seem a bit crazy at first but it actually seems more sensible if you take a closer look yeah i mean i feel with the materialist conception of real like reality it only allows for like let's say the first level if you get on me what i mean the first level of perception what we just see now what we just um perceive every day but i feel something like panpsychism it kind of accounts for the different levels of perception if you get what i'm saying like there's many different like, experiences like levels to reality that um, materialism or you know what you're describing just can't really explain you get what i'm saying like um yeah i do sorry i'm, I'm trying to sort out my charger but i do get what you're saying <laughs> but um <clears throat> yeah it's just something i feel like the trouble with materialism is that when you take that outlook on life, um, you get quite a limited like view slash understanding of it. Like you don't really, you aren't really able to perceive the full picture of existence at the end of the day, which I feel is yeah. quite you know limiting yeah. of all. Mm -hmm. but, um, it definitely is limiting. Um, would you would you want to say a little bit further on that? Because I could talk about how it's limiting. Yeah. Um, but what, how do you mean it's limiting? I know because um, <clears throat> yeah, like I've always been quite um, skeptical about things. Like I've always been, I think all, th all three of us have always been quite skeptical, always like, you know, thought about stuff. Yeah. So I used to have a very materialistic, you know, worldview. Everything was, yeah. um, things could only exist if they were verified by the empirical senses. Um, things, um, as quite a logical positivist, if you know what that is. It's basically yeah, that yeah. Um, empirical science is like the only real metric for like, you know, knowledge, but then I kind of took psychedelics and realized that the spiritual, yeah, I kind of used to discard the spiritual as quite meaningless and just wishy-washy, like, you know, pseudoscience, but then I kind of like, you know, <clears throat> integrated the spiritual with the use of psychedelics and realize that yes it can be really beneficial it can make me even more open-minded and open to new possibilities because I was never closed-minded but I feel this was yeah. a worldview that actually one allowed me to be more open-minded like-minded and two actually allowed me to be a lot more you know rational mm -hmm. because 
I was perceiving something that maybe a materialist wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would say that. Um, I, I would say that um, it actually kind of allows you to be a little bit more rational in that you can take more things into account. I think that's a good yeah. point. Harry, what, what would you think about that? Do you think, I mean, I, you, I assume you think that too, right? I mean, I mean, to be a devil's advocate, I guess, like someone might say, well, you know, you took this drug and it affected your brain and you started to hallucinate, you know, and you just uh -huh. went on this kind of hallucinatory um, trip and that didn't yeah. have any relation with them. Like, how would you argue against, what would you, what would you reply to something like that? I mean, the difference between... Well, Go okay, so you, you take this, Rob. You take this. I've just, I've got a quite a simple response to this. If someone was to say something, let me understand the devil's advocate position. Let me just reiterate: it. is it sort of saying, "Oh, well, you took a drug, uh, you had an experience, and and now you now you think philosophical materialism, uh, or now you think you can see outside the box"? Is that sort of the thing? Is that the position? Yeah, just, just putting down what you've experienced as just a hallucination. Just a, just right, yeah. What would you the think? simple response is so it, it does not matter the medium. Just because it's a hallucination, if it gives you a profound reshuffling of your worldview, which allows you to see things that you never saw before, um, when you're not on the drug, when you're, when you're not tripping, like after you've tripped, it's your worldview is changed. You can't go back even. I mean, then it doesn't matter the, the median, whether it be a scientific inquiry or whether it be an actual primary experience. And I would argue the primary experience is more useful. I mean, what good is empirical uh, positive, positivist scientific uh, inquiry? It's on paper. It's not really relative to your life. It, it's... Um, it's yeah, it's it's not really translatable to your actual existence. But a primary experience is that's all that's all you've actually really got anyway. So I would argue that primary experience is more valid. Um, it's harder to quantify. It's harder to put into a box. But I don't think you should even want to do that with a psychedelic experience anyway. You shouldn't want to do that with any experience. You shouldn't want to quantify love, or you shouldn't want to quantify. Uh, other experiences or even just your waking conscious experience right now why does it need to be quantified it's kind of a neurotic impulse to want to put everything in a box i want to label everything you know am i the only one who thinks that i guess <laughs> but yeah um I was about to say, so it, yeah it's a it's a it's a go on sorry Aaron. no i was about to say one thing that is also important is um your question how i actually opened up a new avenue about misconceptions yeah. people have about, you know, psychedelics. So one thing is that um, people say, oh, it's just hallucinations. Like, mm -hmm. there's a difference between psychedelics and deliriance because deliriance are a whole other class of drugs that only serve to, you know, provide, like, hallucinations. Like, I don't know if you've heard of Datura. Yeah, I've heard of Datura, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, something like Datura, it won't give you, like, I feel like a lot of what people say LSD is like in the media and stuff is kind of what yeah. Dutour and like you know Benadryl is actually like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. which doesn't provide a yeah. spiritual experience or, or like whatsoever, but it just provides you with mm -hmm. like an intense sense of like you know delirium. And I feel if we like you know really settle like you know the differences between delirium and psychedelics then we can see that psychedelics are a lot more you know spiritual and beneficial for the mind than we might think that they aren't really just used for like you know hallucinogens slash experience yeah yeah I guess what I was handling, sorry, I guess what I was saying with that last question was because like isn't it that the psychedelic experience reveals that our ordinary experience is a kind of hallucination because like for instance like a lot of times people report like the psychedelic experience being almost more real than their normal experience. It's more um, authentic. And like the yeah. surprising thing is that what you experience on the psychedelic, it doesn't come in from, from elsewhere. It's like, no. it's, it's revealing something that was already there, but that like, you've yeah. just been kind of invisible. 
So for instance, you could say that like maybe a baby, the experience of a baby is something like psychedelics, but yeah. then over time, as you learn the culture, your, your experience is kind of narrowed into a kind of certain mm-hmm. um, rut that, yeah, exactly. is, is, that you're taught to think and then the psychedelic disrupts that habit maybe. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly that. The, the, it's, a, it's quite a thing to not have had psychedelics. It, it's, it's quite a thing to live a life in a very narrowly predefined or a mystic experience in general. It's, it, it's, it's quite a thing to live in, 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 a, in a cultural worldview or in a worldview. It's, it's, it's quite a thing because it's, it really is a very small reduction of all there is. And uh, it doesn't matter what your flavor is. It doesn't matter if your cultural flavor is West or East, or if it's uh, this religion or that religion, or whether it's this scientific doctrine or this other scientific doctrine. If you've got a worldview, um, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a re- you're living in a small sphere, and then the rest of the universe is outside the sphere. Um, yeah uh, but uh exactly what you said though that the psychedelic experience isn't a hallucinations that come from outside it's more of the sphere of barrels the cultural boundaries the cultural the linguistically sanctioned cultural boundaries get dissolved and then next thing you know you can see everything and and it does appear like hallucinations and etc uh, uh, and a lot of other thoughts too. It's not just hallucinations. You get you get uh, conscious clarity. I like to call it a, a, a very mm-hmm. very amazing sense of clarity comes through. Um, yeah, it, your your cultural exactly um, boundaries dissolve in a psychedelic experience. It's, I think that's why people that you, you're tripping on a delirium. I think that's why people say yeah, a lot. Like um, the reason a lot of like you know countries decide like you know, hey, we're gonna make these substances illegal, we like illegal and stuff. Do you think it is because they shatter these cultural like boundaries? And... Yeah, um, I think that it, it, mm-hmm. it, we are just conspirators if we if we start saying that. Though. But mm-hmm. I do think that, um, I, and I think it it they it, it's. It's a little bit more than that, uh, but I don't think it, that, that they're illegal because a loving government cares about you. I don't think that. I don't think that they. I don't think they're illegal because a government wants you to be safe, and they just care about your consciousness. Don't don't worry, you can trust the government. I think the reason why they're illegal is because yes, they. If you take a psychedelic drug, you look at something like, uh uh property laws or yeah. the economic system you just look at that and you think yeah. how arbitrary yeah. what a load of rubbish because before you think it's so real it doesn't matter what and it, th- this is the thing it doesn't matter what your flavor was it doesn't matter which religion mm-hmm. it was or scientific thing or economic thing you bought mm-hmm. you think it's real and then afterwards you just t- you, you you look at it and you can't help but think how ridiculous it is mm-hmm. and then everyone else is still busy playing the game and it's like do you guys even know that you're playing a rubbish game? And so, yeah, it's, it's not hard to see why uh, institutions don't like them. <laughs> like, let me be real. Um, after my first trip, I just wanted to fight capitalism. I was like, oh, this yeah. world is so beautiful and stuff. And mm-hmm. why are these? Ca-? And then I thought, um, yeah, I have to fight for this beautiful world that's all around me. And now yeah. I have to, like, you know, stand up to the capitalist system. Yeah. I feel that's something that's taking away the beauty from this world oh yeah yeah it's like i mean it is isn't it, it it's yeah. a com- commodification of a uh, how can you even commodify existence it doesn't actually really make any sense if you mm-hmm. have the eyes to see it it's a load of rubbish it, yeah. it's a con game is what it is mm-hmm. yeah it's like i mean i feel something like mm-hmm. existence and stuff i feel commod like commodification is kind of on its on this yeah. first like you know did I mention the plateaus in this podcast? Like, you know, how materialism looks at like, you know, one plateau, the first, at the first level. Um, I feel the stuff like commodities, commodifying something is on 
the first plateau, but something like existence as a whole is on a higher level, and you can't really have you you can't really commodify something on such like you know a high level. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, you 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 could never, and if you what if you did, which we have, I mean, we have commodified it. Then yeah. what you get is a ton of suffering, suffering mm -hmm. everywhere you look, and um, so much discomfort. And, people living awful lives while such a small percent of people have it all right mm -hmm. um yeah it's a, it's a it's a huge spiritual problem and it is interesting because this is when the people like in the 60s uh, in the summer of love they were saying things like everyone should take these substances and i think one of the reasons why they were saying it is that is that because they believed that the institutions would collapse and that's not such a bad thought is it although mm -hmm. Uh, you know we also have to be responsible in a sense but yeah hey ho. <laughs> this, this guy i think you're probably familiar with him rob called terence mckenna yes and he yeah, kind of course. unifies everything that we've been saying here into a kind of narrative mm -hmm. and what he calls like a stone date theory uh, i was yeah. wondering if we could talk maybe a little bit about that because he reckons that the, the, the development of the human brain was very rapid in evolutionary uh -huh. terms wasn't it and he suggests yeah. that maybe the, the reason why our brains developed so rapidly was because we were taking the, the psychedelic mushroom, mm -hmm. uh, psilocybin cubensis, on the plains yeah. of Africa. Yeah. And that stimulated our brains to, go, to grow. Could you allow yeah. me that? I'd be, I'd be happy to. It's, a, I, it's, a, it's one of my quote unquote worldviews that I held to for a long time, um, which I now realize does need a bit of amendment. But it's a fantastic hypothesis. It's not a theory, it's a hypothesis. Um, those familiar will know that a theory is actually when a hypothesis gets proven true with facts. Mm -hmm. So stone date hypothesis is a hypothesis because it's not really provable. You can't go back and you can't point at them and say, look what they did. So it's not provable. So that's the reason why it remains a hypothesis. But stone date hypothesis, um, Terence outlined it in a great book uh, called the food of the gods and the book is fantastic it essentially not only goes through the stone day hypothesis but it also goes through the history of drug use of psychedelic drug use in cultures around the world um trait and then he traces it back to the stone day hypothesis but what the stone day hypothesis essentially answers is a very hard question which is how how you said it how does the human brain size essentially double between 3 million years ago and 150,000 years ago, 150,000 years ago being roughly when we became anatomically human and 3 million years ago being one of our last common ancestors or something like that. Um, the, the, in the fossil record and the scientific literature, that kind of a organ doubling is unprecedented. It's huge. It, it, it's, 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 it's a huge question and it doesn't have an answer. It doesn't have an mainstream answer. So the stone date hypothesis is, tries to answer that question. Um, and it essentially states something like this. So um, imagine uh, when the Sahara, because the Sahara at this point in time, or but three million years ago, was more like a, a rainforest. And then climate change starts to happen and it becomes more like plains. So our ancestors come out of the trees and they start walking upright. Over, over generations, we're imagining timescales here. They start walking upright and hunting. What what are they doing? They they follow cattle um, because following cattle is uh, you, you you know where the food is you at all times and and what grows out of cattle poo cow dung is psilocybin cubensis and it grows out of cow dung all over the world um, but essentially in nice pasturey climates really which is what the Sahara was at the time. Um, and psilocybin cubensis has high quantities of psilocybin and um, it's a mushroom that you can get today, although obviously we don't condone that. But um, uh, what the hypothesis goes that perhaps some of these apes three million years ago uh, in their scouting for, ca for cows would have flipped over some of these dung at some point in time and seen these mushrooms, um, eaten some of them and then over time in more but what's in what's important is that even in a low dose um eating a small amount of psilocybin like one or two mushrooms 
has evolutionary benefits. And this is documented by Terence and also Roland Griffiths in his, uh, he did other research, um, not just on cancer patients and not just on uh, uh, people with addiction. He also did very low doses um, to uh, sort of to, to measure visual acuity on psychedelic, on psilocybin. And what he found was that visual acuity, I won't go into the experience too much unless you guys ask later. Um, what he found was that the visual acuity was dramatically increased uh, uh, by quite a, a remarkable amount. So imagine these apes 3 million years ago. Now they actually have an advantage to taking this thing. So let's say they keep eating these in small doses over a few generations, a few, te a few tens of generations. Um, eventually they're gonna start eating more. Maybe they start to now have uh, um, enough where they, it induces a mystic experience or something akin to that. I don't know how their brain would have worked or something like that, but now they start to have a lot of mushrooms and they get, they, they trip in, in the colloquial term. Now they trip. The trip would be, insane it would be a massive flood of data into their brains and um things would look like they've never looked before just imagine these stone dates right it, it's quite a thing to imagine but it's probably it would be good for them and then so they'd probably want to do it a lot and if they did do it a lot um it's not hard to see where things like religion come from and language but what's also important to know with psilocybin, one of the effects that the actual chemical has, um, I'm sorry if my thoughts are a little bit incoherent at the moment, but one of the most important features of psilocybin as a chemical is that it causes something in the brain called neurogenesis, or it doesn't cause it, but it, it helps along neurogenesis. And what neurogenesis is, is the forming of new neural pathways between neurons in your brain. So you can't form new neurons in your brain because you have the same amount of neurons from birth to death, but you can form new neural pathways and neurogenesis promotes this function. Now, it's quite hard to see where just a chemical over two, over two and a half or so, or nearly three million years could cause, uh, just a chemical causing neurogenesis could cause the brain size to double. Um, but it's very easy to see how it could be a, strong contributing factor and one of the other uh, hypotheses which is worth a lot is the is a hypothesis called social brain hypothesis and um also how which is linked to uh, how language could have caused the brain size to double and what's interesting about the stoned ape hypothesis is if you imagine these stoned apes um tripping it's not hard to see how they might have come up or, or, or started to sing and have more complex language and religions and social form, social forms, um, which would then have spurred on social brain hypothesis and the other language hypothesis too, which I can't remember the name. Maybe it is actually just social brain hypothesis. Um, that's stone ape in a nutshell, essentially, and I've kind of butchered the explanation. But if you are interested, Terence's book, Food of the Gods, is fantastic, and it's like less than a minute. <laughs> So it kind of says a lot more than that, doesn't he, though? Because when you take the mushroom, the mushroom is unique in that you hear that you speak to the mushroom, don't you? Like, it's like um, there's reports that you, you, you feel like you're communicating with some kind of intelligence beyond your own intelligence, which is quite different yeah. from other drugs like NSD and stuff. You feel yeah. like you're in communion with some kind of higher intelligence. And so what yeah. we're kind of saying is that the mushroom is like... An, in uh, um, like a mind that exists beyond yeah. our world and that it like sends out spores through the universe and colonizes different planets and stuff. And that when you take a mushroom, you're tapping into this higher intelligence, this kind of galactic hive mind or something of, 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 <laughs> of mushrooms spanning across multiple planets. And that the mushroom is trying to, is, so like because we're taking the mushroom for so long in, in the, yeah. you know, for, three million years or whatever. We developed yeah. like a symbiosis with the mushroom. Yeah, yeah. Because the mushroom is trying to get us to become an intergalactic, a space-faring species so that we can spread these spores through the universe kind of thing. It's like a symbiosis. I do, yeah. and I do believe that, um, sorry, just briefly, um, that his, uh, 
that's more anecdotal how it could be a galactic thing but definitely the symbiosis and definitely how the mushrooms are mined yeah how it could yeah. be galactic is a bit anecdotal but yeah carry but on. That, that symbiosis <laughs> thing, it ties into what you were saying before because you know how we're talking about the ego yes like the ego and how psychedelics um the psychedelic trip isn't necessarily a hallucination it reveals that the ordinary way of thinking and, and saying and stuff is the hallucination and so like when you don't take the psychedelics your experience kind of restricts itself into kind of like certain habits and restrictions uh -huh. like uh -huh. egoic ways of thinking and the mushroom the psychedelics dissolve those ways of thinking and so like the, the, without the psychedelics because obviously we're not taking them anymore like in the past when we're dancing around the fire and stuff we'll be doing like psychedelic uh you know parties and stuff every yeah. every week or whatever but now we're not doing anything like that and so yeah. without this kind of other half of our biology which which he suggests that the mushroom is it's mm. our symbiote yes we're now living in a, in a way that the ego is like a kind of cancerous growth that has grown in the absence of this mushroom yeah yeah uh i i do actually agree with that and that's a point that i haven't said in a while actually because i've i've got i've gotten quite used to uh people um not liking the idea that we're a symbiote so I, I stopped talking about it but I remember when I first found out uh, when I when I first looked into the stone date that was the thing that that kind of grabbed me the most actually was um the fact that or, or the, the hypothesis that we have a symbiotic relationship with the mushroom and I, I don't think it's hard to believe if you look at what a mushroom what mushrooms are they're much older than us they've been around for a long fucking time um we come from mushrooms and so do plants but plants and mammals come from mushrooms if you look at the evolutionary web uh, i don't know what you might call that um fossil record uh we're fungal bodies and so are plants our, our brains are fungal bodies when you look at mycelium which is the bit of mushrooms underground you look at mycelium the the way they spread out it looks it's uncanny to the way neurons are in the brain so we're fungal bodies that's not a leap that's a that's a observable truth um however you want to define the word truth but um to 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 then think that there could be some kind of different kind of conscious that a mushroom could inhabit that to me isn't even a leap but i can imagine to some people how it is a leap though. um but i don't think it's a leap and then to to think that you can I haven't personally communicated with the mushroom, but that's because of, I, I, I have heard that you have to get the, you have to sort of allow the conditions for it. You're supposed to do it in silent darkness and do a, a specific, uh, quite a fair amount um, in well, silent darkness and not have anyone in there and not talk or anything. Mm -hmm. Pardon? So it's kind of like a heroic dose. Is that what it basically is? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, to talk to the mushroom, that is. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd love to talk to the mushroom. I, I, I need the, you need the chance. I mean, like I said, I don't do psychedelics all the time, uh, but I'd love to one time, um, possibly soon. But it's not hard for me to see how the mushroom is a mind and how it can be interfaced with. To me, I don't even see that as a jump, but I can completely understand how someone who hasn't taken these substances might see that as a jump. And that's one of the reasons why I stopped really talking about that for a while. But um it's it's not hard if people are interested to see how mushrooms are an ancient thing on this earth at least and um it, it's not a leap to think that they could inhabit a kind of consciousness and it's not a leap to think that we could interface with them so if people are interested check it out <laughs> um well, if you're right about mysticism then it's the same consciousness isn't it yeah yeah that's that's what that's what a mystic would say it's what i'd say um yeah how do you contrast that with lsd though because I, when i've had experiences on like you know yeah. lsd um, i felt like i've gone into computer simulation it's not really as like you know because i think i saw a comparison like mushrooms are like lord of the rings and lsd is like it's... star wars kind of like so <laughs> LSD is more <laughs> sci-fi so i feel like i'm going into like the simulation so Every time I go I've never into had that, LSD. I, I always feel like I'm going into the matrix or whatever, and I'm accessing, you know, the code to all life and stuff. Like that's very you, interesting. How do you contrast that with like, you know, 
God being the mushroom and stuff? Um, well, I don't know. It's it's not necessarily God being the mushroom. It's that if mushroom inhabits consciousness and we inhabit mm-hmm. or, or we experience consciousness and mushroom experience consciousness, the consciousness we're experiencing is the same thing. So mm-hmm. it, it's it's more like that regard. Uh, it's very interesting what you say about the, the visuals and stuff associated with the substances because it, 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 they're more anecdotal in my opinion, but they are worth discussing. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason why I think they're anecdotal is because uh, I've never actually even really had anything digital of LSD. I mm-hmm. more get more, I get, it's very blissful. I get very, um, uh, very blissful imagery of like e- Egyptian imagery and like, Same. um, uh, marble pyramids and stuff like that is great um but um so it's just why i think it's a bit anecdotal because everyone kind of sees visuals and they kind of see them differently um but they are still worth talking about it's very interesting why do we get flooded visual imagery why, why is that a phenomenon that happens i think what i think um, personally i mean this is only yeah. my theory don't take it as sacrosanct this is just my little interpretation <laughs> What yeah. I feel is like the mystic experience for everyone is subjective mm-hmm. and like even if there is one like you know one universal truth um everyone interprets yeah. it in different ways so yeah I might interpret it as you know a simulation you might interpret it as like you know pyramids and stuff like mm-hmm. yeah you might how you might interpret it as just like you know consciousness and stuff so yeah I feel that's a link between our personalities and how our spiritual mm-hmm. experiences work, if you get what I'm saying. It's like yeah, different people, it's different cultures. Yeah. Sorry. No, carry on, Harry. Yes. Yeah, I was just say, like, when you have mystical, like, religious experiences in different cultures, like if you're a Buddhist, you see the Buddha. If you're a Catholic, you'll see yeah. the Virgin Mary, kind of things. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's culturally dependent. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's an interesting. It's an interesting perspective, um, because. Well, what we was what we was just saying, and what I still hold to be what happened is that cultural um, ideals get dissolved. Yet somehow the imagery is still kind of um, your your cultural perception still kind of pervades the imagery, or maybe the imagery or the the ultimate truth that you might be perceiving still kind of gets refracted through the lens of your past beliefs. Which is interesting to think about. I don't know why that should be the case or anything like that. Um, what I've also thought was cool about the imagery is that it's always it's like it's quite stunning. It's, yeah. uh, uh, that's a thing. Yeah. What? Uh, but it is always quite stunning. I never see anything like it. I, and I always, well, uh, when I first took these and was telling people about them, because obviously, you know, you how when you do start taking them, you, you're a rampant human face exactly um uh, what, what i was or- always originally saying was how i could have never imagined anything like it before ever no way it, it doesn't matter how long if you said imagine what lsd is going to be like before i'd ever taken it and gave me 20 years to imagine i could have never have even come up with it a fraction of a second of an LSD experience. It's, it's so unimaginable. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, you could take it right now. Obviously, we don't condone the use of drugs, but you could take it right now if you wanted to and see something that you never experienced ever before and never thought was even possible. And I think that's quite crazy. So, yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about with higher states of like, you know, higher plateaus and stuff. Like, that's what I'm yes. talking about. Um, yeah, because I feel F, a lot of people are on. You know, I don't want to sound like a pretentious sass hat here. I don't want to sound like, you know, someone who sees yeah. himself as above people. But like, I do sometimes feel yeah. that, you know, people who haven't had the experience, they experience life on the first plateau, but then you yeah. kind of have, like psychedelics kind of take you up a level. They kind of allow you to have at least a look into the higher plateaus of like, you know, existence, but yeah. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just how I interpret no. the experience. No, I interpret it in a similar sort of way. Although I do think it's more of an emphasis on that. It's at least a look because uh, you come down after the trip. 
the, the the thing is though so you don't stay in the higher plateaus but you do come down having seen the higher plateau and mm -hmm. that does i mean that changes you i the honest truth i can't tell you what i was like at 18 before i took these i can't tell you how i thought i can't tell you i don't remember uh, how i am now is so fundamentally different how i think and uh okay so you do come down but mm -hmm. you have seen and it's now your well, it's it's now your job it's now your task of your everyday existence to sort of figure out how you can live on the first level which is ego consciousness because you come down to have an ego i'm wrong uh, you come down to have wrong but it's it's uh, what do you make of it now now that you've seen everything you thought was mm -hmm. just what you thought now what are you going to do about it um that's the that's what life is i guess mm -hmm. but hey who are you too psychedelics? <laughs> <laughs> what are you two psychedelics though like what was the thing that pushed you in in that direction <laughs> uh we were just um <laughs> it's not a good answer we were just taking a lot of mdma and someone had some lsd uh and we just took it one night on mdma it was it was <laughs> i would never recommend that to anyone uh and can flipping? yeah can flip it, it was it was uh, although it was insane I, I say i would never recommend anyone to do it and that's my official answer i would never recommend anyone to do that especially on a first time I'm sorry. however it was insane it was beautiful it, uh, and it completely shattered everything what i thought i took it at 18 november 2018 and i uh, uh it blew every my whole mind hole right out of the door for for two i was doing sick form at the time and i took it on the weekend and then for the next two weeks at home at sick form etc i was just staring at my hands and staring at everything like but what the fuck and i was going to school and i was like why are people going to school why are we learning about this whilst just staring at my hands couldn't even believe that i had a body and shit like <clears throat> yeah it was good but yeah. I, I wouldn't recommend combining it with mdma it was quite intense <laughs> not the first time not the first time certainly not no, not the first time <laughs> <laughs> yeah but the effects uh, uh, people can only a testament to their personal experience but almost everyone that you do that's had a positive experience will just tell you that it was one of the most important if not the most yeah. important and at least the most amazing experience of yeah. their life and that's quite a testament isn't it mm -hmm. i think so Wait, yeah would you agree or not Harry? because i would definitely say that my favorite experiences certainly have been at least the most ex important experiences to forming who i am now have been on you know psychedelics like how about you howie would you say would you say that um, one? i mean you know it's certainly intense you know yeah the most intense i mean i i looked at a study recently though it was quite interesting it was talking about how um they did like mri scans of people on psychedelics and it was mm -hmm. like when they took the psychedelic the, their brain activity decreased so like across the board there was like a decrease in the metabolic activity in their brains Really? Uh, and so, and like, so it was talking about like, um, yeah, and it was the same as with like, you know, when you have like a pilot who like does a loop, the loop and he goes under like tremendous G force. Yeah. And his brain uh -huh. shuts down because of like oxygen deprivation and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then these like, and then these pilots report having like out of body experiences and stuff like that when they're unconscious, mm -hmm. and like when you when you get deprived of oxygen, and so like mm -hmm. there's this connection between having. Because like, you know, like that materialistic model that we we're talking about, that the mind is produced yeah. by the brain and that your experiences map on the brain states. Well, that obviously yeah. isn't true. If, if, if the most intense experiences of your life, like you were saying, like some of these psychedelic experiences are yeah. like you, you meet God, you, you know, you've been yeah. in the center of the universe, like crazy experiences, yeah. but your brain activity actually decreases. It yeah. suggests that really perhaps that's more to experience than what's going on in the brain i, I, I can yeah. find the link and send it here to the to the experiment um, i think he's the exp an explanation or an interpretation aaron might be something like um the, the more brain activity is conducive to living in a cultural mm -hmm. perception 
you're analyzing everything culturally, judging everything, having opinions mm-hmm. and everything based on your thing. That's conducive to having more brain activity mm-hmm. and having less brain activity would be conducive to not thinking of those things and just instead uh, experiencing less thinking in a sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a, That's a great study though, Harry, in terms of, yeah, like the materialist would say, um, or contradicting what the materialist might say. I think, I think it's, it's definitely interesting. Um, so I just I'm biased people. anyway. I mean, yeah. um, I don't know, but to me, um, it sounds like something more disassociatives would do so. Something like Kevin. Uh, they are too. PSM oh, yeah. Would wow. make me feel. Have you ever had any experience with them or not? Oh, my friend. I'm going to tell you now. Tell um, me, tell me, please. I'm going to tell you right now about ketamine. Uh, I, I am actually, I think ketamine is the weirdest out of them all. Really? I, I, I do think that uh, K-holes, so do enough to get in a K-hole, although obviously don't do drugs because we don't condone drugs. But ketamine, the thing about psychedelics is that they always have a profound meaning or something like that. But ketamine, mm-hmm. as far as I've, my experiences are concerned, doesn't mean anything. It's just the weirdest experience that you've ever had in your entire life. I've, I'll tell you now, and this is anecdotal because it's just an experience, but this is why I think Ket is the weirdest. When On my first K-hole, um, first of all, whilst you're falling into the hole, which is what you're doing you're in your mind, your eyes closed and on the floor, you're not moving, you're falling into a hole. You're really like literally rapidly falling through what you perceive. It's like black whatever shadows land or whatever something like that and like uh things are being built around you and you're being wrapped up and dragged and fallen and things like that. that's like falling through yeah. and then when i fell through it was like uh it was like the spaces and this has happened on times after almost every time after i do care you get to like a space between the only way I could describe it is like realities, although I'm not prepared to say that's what it is or anything like that. So I'm saying Kets just straight up fucking weird. But yeah. I get I got to a space where I was like it felt like between realities. That's just what it perceived like. And then on this trip, when I came down, yeah. when I was coming down, reality was reorganizing and I got reorganized into my dad. I thought I was my dad. No, I thought I was my dad. This is what I'm saying. It's completely insane. Uh, I had a, I had a whole trip. It felt like a long time. It felt like ages where I was my dad. Like I was, it was my dad's body. And I wasn't even really aware that I was Rob's dad. I was just Ian Barnard. I was, I was Ian. I was walking around Ian looking like, uh, like all of this happened in like an hour, but it felt like fucking yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Ket is dissociated like Ket. I ain't got an explanation for you as far as that's concerned, mm-hmm. but I'm pretty sure it's one of the weirdest ones. I mean, yeah. it's just nuts. <laughs> that sounds mm-hmm. like Salvia. Sounds yeah, like I want to try Salvia too. That's the one. Mm. I've heard about um, Salvia reports and stuff, Pardon. and experiences, and it's definitely yeah. like that yeah. for 20 minutes. So you're looking at the co- you're yeah. looking at um, the desk. But then you are the desk. Yeah. You become the desk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, I, I think, and you know what? I mean, that there's something more to that, or maybe there's even something to the cat. But I think it's just so interesting how your consciousness can change. Yeah, like how, how? Why the fuck can you perceive yourself as a desk, or why the fuck could I perceive myself as my dad? Why? I don't know. It's definitely interesting, though. I, I think it speaks to something panpsychist. I, I think, but mm-hmm. maybe I'm conflating, and maybe I shouldn't. But yeah. you mean yeah, you are yeah. seeing the world from your dad's eyes and living his life, or you are li- living your life, but you just felt like you were your dad? I couldn't tell you. It was more like the first one, uh, uh, but because it was honestly like I, I wasn't even thinking that I was me in my dad's body. I was, and I wasn't even thinking that I was Ian. But there was still a layer of Rob. It was just then I was Ian, and my dad's never done drugs or anything like. It's so straight edge, but I, I was just. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I was him for a bit. I don't know. It was like you were. It's like you were in his house from his perspective, making a cup of tea and stuff, and what reading the I newspaper. Couldn't, I couldn't tell you what I saw, but I was just him in it. I, I, I was just him, and it's happened another time. I tell you another time, and anecdotal. Other people have also reported same sort of things. Like um, someone I know, when they was listening to music, uh, could have thought or get glimpses of when you think you're the guy. Or and and what I was saying now is when I, I did ketamine one time, um, I was doing it to get in a K hole, and whilst I was doing it on the come up, because you have to actually sniff quite an an ungodly amount of this substance, mm-hmm. it's quite a lot. So on the come up, whilst I was doing it, I was watching James Acaster, the comedian, mm-hmm. and for bits, I f- I was him. Like I was on stage, the crowd was in front of me, and like. Uh, 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 and but I would like phasing in and out between the two. Yeah, it's weird. It's disassociative. I don't know, but it's fucking strange. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Do you think there's a fundamental difference between so dissociatives are crazy, but do they give you any insight really? Like, I don't think they no. give you that much real insight into the world and how to like you know no. improve yourself. No, I wouldn't person. say so. I think they if just... they have, I missed the message. <laughs> Maybe it's be more like your dad, Rob. Maybe that was the Yeah, message. maybe it is. <laughs> maybe had some underlying... You know, I don't want to go too deep into that, but... That's okay. We can I just really like that. But... I could have gone quite... But, um, yeah, like... I mean, something that's super interesting is... Um, I mean, something we haven't touched upon, the fractal elephant in the room, um, yeah. is probably DMT. You haven't touched oh, right. on that experience yet. Yeah. Like, um, um, have you heard about anyone who's done DMT or not? Yeah, I, I know a couple of people online who have done it. Um, people that I know online, I, I'm not actually, and someone I knew's dad did it. Uh, and I've meant to done it, meant to have done it now like three or four times, but it keeps eluding me. Although mm-hmm. the thing is, I'm, I'm also not trying to force it. I'm, I'm quite yeah. conscious of just letting it sort of come up when it comes up. But it's almost happened like three times keep slipping me but i'll do it eventually at some point Mm -hmm. but we have to talk about it although it is worth saying that none of us have done it Uh, harry have you done it no no yeah but from what everyone says and even research because there is research into dmt if people are interested just look at rick strassman uh he wrote a book on his research that he did called the spirit molecule but what almost everyone or what pretty much everyone reports as seeing almost unanimous almost unanimous which is quite amazing in of itself is bursting into another dimension which is inhabited by other entities made of geometrical changing shapes which love you uh, and things like that and what's also interesting is a bit more anecdotal and not really reported in Strassman's research but recent but since his research is people saying things like um, the entities uh, welcome you back. That's the thing. They welcome you back. They say, oh, it's good to see you again and things like that. So they don't speak English. They, I don't know. I haven't done it. But the, um, and, they t- and some people, someone I know said uh, they were really worried about now leaving them. And then they was like st- telling him, although not in English, more like telling him, but they just understood um that it's okay because you're going to come back and things like that uh it's just uh, it, that sounds insane to me i i, I not insane as in it's, as in it's not sane it sounds cra- as in uh, astonishing to me i have to do it i don't know about you guys but i have to see that i can't just believe other people you know machine elves yeah yeah that's that's how terence described them yeah and um, that's one way of talking about them. It's interesting because even then, that's, that's Terence's. I mean, he's Irish, isn't he? So it's, it, that's why he might think of them or might perceive them through a lens, a bit of Irishness in there, <laughs> seeing elves. But really, what most people, and even he on, on deep analysis, that's just his word for them. But they weren't elves and they weren't machines either. They're more like those are just words for them. There's no words for these things. There's no words for anything in psychedelics, and I can definitely see how there'd be no words for what these guys are talking about. But what they are talking about is like entities. They are always described as 
things that that like how you're an entity, they're an entity. They're not in your brain. At least that's not how they are perceived. And they're made of like self-transforming geometry and they speak this geometry and make things with it and it's all visual it's all showing you stuff but you can understand the geometry that's how they speak they like spew this geometric vomit which shimmers and changes and morphs right in front of your eyes and becomes other things which also does it too but you understand it so yeah it sounds pretty really wow. bombing isn't it pardon the elves they're trying to get you to do that as well they're trying yeah. to teach you how to speak the speak that visual yeah. language yeah uh, uh this is what this is what i'm saying though whenever i talk about it i do get a bit frustrated i, I because i haven't done it I, I i i just have to do it you know i can't yeah. from what i mean i'm sure other people listening to this just think that that sounds like completely unheard of and that's my motivation for wanting to do it i can't just and i hope Although obviously I don't condone the use of drugs, but I hope that other people have my inclination to just not believe that. I have to see that for myself, especially since it's apparently so accessible. All you have to do, I mean, you smoke DMT and it's three hits. You, you take three puffs of this stuff and you can see for yourself whether it's true or not, or as they say or not, or anything like that. I've got to see for myself. I, I certainly can't believe other people just their opinions when they say that you can break through to the dimension and meet entities i can't just take their word for it i have to see you know like surely i mean i've heard it can also really i don't know if even more so than like you know mushrooms and stuff but it can really change your personality and outlook on life so let's say you know mike tyson yeah like yeah mike tyson did yeah. he had like a dmt experience and he changed from being this materialistic like you know aggressive man who yeah, bit exactly. people's ears off and like you know <laughs> may have been you know sexually like <clears throat> assaulting people to someone who was really chilled out and really spiritual i mean he essentially became a teddy bear really. yeah yeah <laughs> have you seen have you seen the joe rogan podcast with him yeah exactly yeah even the way he speaks he sounds like he just wants to give everyone a hug <laughs> <laughs> like I mean, I think that's I think that's um a different kind of DMT. It's five meo DMT. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's the toad and stuff. Like what I think they do is um they secrete the like the stuff from the glands of the toad. Then they put it out in the sun to dry. And I think uh -huh. they scrape it off, don't they? Yeah, exactly. And then and apparently that's like the most powerful form, just because like I think it's even shorter than normal DMT, but it's like the most yeah. potent. Yeah. The ordinary DMT just lasts me for 10 minutes. The entire trip just lasts for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Or less, or, or a little bit more, but yeah, around about 10 minutes, which is, it, I mean, that's insane. And, and, and that's another benefit in my eyes, although we don't condone the use of drugs, but that's another benefit to me is that you'll come down in 10 minutes or under. So you'll be fine in 10 minutes or under, but you can apparently break through to a whole other dimension of, 5-MEO is a little bit different though, isn't it? Apparently it's more like, it's not called the spirit molecule, it's called the God molecule because yeah. it's more like a, bli a, a blinding white light, a unifying mm -hmm. blinding white light. And there's not really entities, it's more like just everything, like God, like um, equally worth fucking trying, uh, you know, like, geez, especially if you come down so fast. Although where are you going to get these toads from? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> DMT is produced by the brain, isn't it, naturally? Yeah, that's what we're. That's what they're trying to prove now. It's it's quite hard to get studies on alive humans to you know look at their anatomy of their brains. It's quite hard. Mm -hmm. um, we know it's produced in rats in their brains, and we we're pretty sure it's produced by us in our lungs. Um, mm -hmm. Although I couldn't quote the study on that, and I can't remember the rat one either. Uh, <laughs> um, no, nah, I can't remember the rat one, but. Um, we're pretty sure it's produced in the pituitary gland in the brain. Yeah. The pituitary gland is where you uh, secrete all of your uh, hormones from your hormone. Uh, I want to just say something. I literally just had a light bulb moment about oh. communicating with the mushroom. I, I completely yeah. forgot about this, um, about how the mushroom, it's not how, why it's not a leap to see how the mushroom could communicate with us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
I'm sorry I didn't say this because this is actually so Go crucial. It. And it's in it's in oh, Terence's yeah. book. Who people really should read Terence's book, Food of the Gods, if you want to know more about the Stone Date hypothesis. But my, plants and or plants and animals communicate with hormones and pheromones. Plants communicate with pheromones with each other, which are like hormones, but just outside. And humans communicate with hormones and also exo hormones or is it called exo pheromones mm -hmm. i think it's i'm just going to use the term exo hormones now that might not be the actual right term but it's it's yeah. still what i'm talking about and what it is is it's like with plants with exo pheromones or exo hormones whichever one it is what it is is it's like a molecule that a plant uses to communicate with another species of plant or another species in general like um and the communication doesn't have to be talking, but it could just, it's just the level of interaction. It's how a molecule is the medium between one being, one species and another species. In a lot of plants, a lot of plants have defense mechanisms in terms of um, molecules that they have, which makes them poisonous to animals and to insects, or to make them beneficial, like um, molecules that help the, uh, that draw bees and wasps to help spread nectar and things like that for pollination, reproduction. Um, plants produce hormones outside of them, which interact with other species. Now, mushrooms have psilocybin in them, yeah. which has no function in the mushroom. It, it, they produce psilocybin in large quantities, but as far as we can tell, it has no um, uh, and there's been lots of studies, and I couldn't quote them now, but it's worth looking up because the literature is there, it's published. There's, there's, there's no benefits for psilocybin to help the mycelium spread in psilocybin mushrooms. It doesn't help, the, it doesn't maintain the boundaries. Or, or I think it may actually, something like that, something like it, but I'm not even going to say because I don't know. But essentially, there's no real benefit to the psilocybin in the mushroom, yet the mushroom produces the psilocybin. Now, it could be a form of exopheromone or something like that, because it's the molecule that binds onto our brain that causes the experience, that causes you to be able to speak to the mushroom entity and generally just get um, the thing about shrooms in general, the psychedelics too, but what shrooms do is they have a general message and the general message is something like, come on humans, you're messing up the world right now, it's time to stop, something like that. That's generally what the shrooms are saying. And if the mushrooms are an ancient being and what mushrooms are too is a is a are they like the foundations of food webs the foundation of food webs uh, they maintain the soil and trees and and, and uh, things like that so if a mushroom had a message it would be to take care of the ecosystem and they have an exopheromone or a candidate which could be an exopheromone psilocybin they have a message which we seem to perceive. So the jump is not a big jump as far as I'm concerned. I don't even think it's a jump. I think it's just, it's the same as any other scientific inquiry. You look at the dots and you connect them. Yeah. Um, and those are the dots just waiting to be connected. And the, if people might ask, why haven't they been connected yet? Well, it's because there is a doctrine now in science and it's a doctrine called materialism. And it's... Mm -hmm hindered a lot of things not just it's hindered lots of philosophical thought not just so in day hypothesis but yeah one thing i think is um i mean i i was actually watching a video the other day on you know it's kind of different it's kind of a tangent but it's still somewhat related to how mm -hmm. you know honey mushrooms you know the honey mushroom um how it's shaped the ecosystem i think oh are you, are you talking about stamets i think so yeah like you know this um this giant mushroom that's um this giant fungal network that's basically, you know, shaped most like ecosystems and stuff like yeah. hundreds of, I think it started hundreds of millions of like, you know, years yeah, ago. Yeah. So the theory could be that those mushrooms were made to shape the world around us. Yeah. Whilst the magic mushrooms were made to shape our inner world. So one mushroom was made to yeah. shape the outer world and the other mushroom was made to shape the inner world. Well, really, they're the same thing, really. Yeah. What the, what the, and they have the same actual primary goal. Well, mm -hmm. if the mushrooms, if, and now this is me uh, speculating the motivations of bloody mushrooms, 
But <laughs> if I think the mushrooms have any motivation, it's that they want uh, the earth to be in a balance. Yeah. The mushrooms maintain ecosystems. That's not a trivial point. That's a that's a big deal. Yeah. Like you say, the honey mushroom and other mushrooms too, they, they maintain soil acidity balances and they help the decomp decom decomposition of uh, biomass in soil and things like that, which helps the cycle of life and and things like that. So they maintain ecosystems and our ecosystem Earth, as a large ecosystem is out of balance and it's out of balance because of humans now, I mean, it's been out of balance in the past, but right now it's because of humans. So if mushrooms have a goal, it's to tell the monkeys to stop their nonsense. And that's what the message seems to be. And we're the monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what I think maybe, um, I don't know if you could, you could actually link this back to um, Marxism and stuff like, and the transition from capitalism to socialism or capitalism to communism or socialism to communism. Um, maybe that will be benefited by the use of like, you know, mushrooms and stuff and psychedelics. Like maybe this increase well, in price could be a sign that, you know, things are going to change. We're going to shift into, into a whole new, less destructive. I'm not so world. sure. Um, the yeah. only reason why I'm not so sure is um, because I, I don't see what I think the psychedelics do and what the mushrooms do is really what they're telling us. Socialism is a good idea for yeah. people to live in a city, however, or in society. But I think what the mushrooms are actually telling us is to stop living in cities, to stop living in societies, yeah. stop living in cultures. And um, that's a much, I can easily see how that's not, Although the mushrooms are telling us to do it, but I can easily see how it's not a, a, a realistic goal because we have rampant society and rampant culture and billions of people. It'd be very hard to tell everyone to stop living in cities and go live out. But I do think that that's generally actually, I think, I think this, I think as long as we continue to live in cities and cultures, and mm -hmm. societies and have any kind of ideology, where, no matter what the ideology is, as long as we continue to do that, it's always going to be problems. And yeah. you know, because we're not we're not meant to live in cities. We're not even meant to live in in villages or towns or even houses. We're we're wandering nomadic. Uh, mm. It's a wandering nomadic species. We're not meant to stay in one place and farm and overproduce and sell it and things like that. Although I understand that socialism would have less selling. Than, yeah but still it's a uh, we're not really meant to live in large groups and there's just so many problems with living in large groups and i think one of the things mushrooms might be saying is your large group living is causing lots of trouble you silly humans <laughs> <laughs> like no you you carry on how because you you seem like you're about to say something like an, an odd point you know like that you should that you would say that we shouldn't live in cities and stuff because it just seems like that itself is a kind of ideology like Surely, yeah, it is a bit. You know, it doesn't really make a great deal of sense to me, like that, because the fact that we live in cities, because because like it seems to me like the psych what what's so surprising about the psychedelics is that you think that you live in a dead universe, and you think that you know how like the scientists say like oh yes we're intelligent life and we're looking for intelligent life among the stars uh -huh. kind of thing. yeah and what so like to think that life is like locked up inside bodies. And that we live in a kind of dead inanimate universe and then yeah. we are living creatures. Whereas really what's so surprising is that that's not the case at all, really. It's, it's that reality itself is alive. And that's yeah. what, you know what I mean? Like when you look at the walls and stuff and yeah. you've been conditioned to think that, oh, that's a dead material object. That's just an uh -huh. inanimate matter. But then you take the drug and the boundaries collapse and you and you realize it's, it, it you know, it's, it, it, it like breathes with you. You know, like when you yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like in the Matrix where he, realizes he's the one and yeah and he flexes the, yeah, the, the yeah exactly it, there's there's something to that is isn't there that that yeah that the world reality itself is alive kind of thing mm -hmm. and so you know like maybe there's a point to be made that we never really left the forest you know like in that, yeah. in that there is that point in that the uh, the and that the cities themselves are, it's not that they're not alive and that's why we must leave them though that's what i'm saying it's more like living in 
boxes detaches you from the outside. Mm-hmm. It's too much. It's too much trying to have order. And mm-hmm. also what it does is there's lots of, I mean, first of all, that, that point alone, uh, it's a Nietzschean point, how um, having too much order or a, t- a desire for everything to be ordered is uh, quite problematic. And, you know, living in, even just living in squares on roads um, is uh, having order. Uh, what we're trying to do by living in cities and he was saying it back then, and what he was really saying was about the Greeks, what they were trying to do, and civilization when it first came along, in living in cities, was trying to get away from the chaos of nature. But the chaos of nature is, stops us running around like headless chickens, which is what we're doing now. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that the problem isn't the, our like location or our way of life. It's more our self-identification as individual separate selves. That seems to me to be the, the root problem. Yeah, that's the root problem. I would say that. I, I would. I would only say really, um, and maybe it's a finality, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's just my opinion, which it, I mean, it's definitely just my opinion. But maybe it's just my opinion. But uh, what I would say is that cities, I think cities perpetuate that root problem. I think cities make it much easier to self-identify. Cities. I mean, I think if you live in a hut in the woods you would have a hard tr- time being selfish. That's what I think. And I think if you live in a city, you have a very easy time being selfish. In fact, it is encouraged. Uh, you have, uh, and everyone else is busy being selfish in the city. So that's just what I think. But as long as you live in a hut in the woods, yeah. you haven't got rid of the ego, have you? No, I'm not, it's not necessarily about that. It's just, I think you, I think you just have a much easier time understanding ecosystems if you live in the woods and I don't necessarily think everyone should live in huts in the woods, but I just think cities have perpetuate or group living around wars, walling off nature perpetuates us living in our own ego consciousness and then exploiting nature. I just think it makes it much easier. What I meant was that like, if, if you think I am living in the woods, then you're, then you're conceptualizing yourself as a separate self that's living in the woods, aren't you? So yeah. Like, when you get rid of that self-identification, you're always in the same place, which is the universe. You are, you know what I mean? Like you are the universe. Yeah, if you, if you can, if you can get rid of your self-identification at all times, I'm sure you'd have no problem living anywhere. A lot of people don't. And when we live in cities, though, people are. It's, it's so easy to self-identify. It's encouraged, is what I'm saying. It's 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 the dominated thing. I mean, you've got to look out for yourself. Everyone else is, and you live in your little box, your little square. And if you can get rid of your self-identification at all points in time, you, you, yeah, you'll have no problem anyway. You could live your life meditating and um, it would be blissful, fantastic even, and nothing else would be able to even touch you But because you'd be everything else. But that's not the case for most people. And I just think that the city's perpetuate the root cause which is self-identification as you say yeah i just think that i, would say I think it go on i would say you can't fully get rid of self-identification like you can control it of course you can sort of be like hey um but it can be a positive thing i think though like i do think a degree of like yeah. not a high degree but a degree of self-identification can be yeah. good kind of like sugar in a way like a degree of sugar is really good for you but if you have too much of course you're get diabetes and shit like you can't and too many people just have too much self-identification too much mm-hmm. image focus I just, well i was just uh, sorry i was interrupted no, no, it's no, just no. It's, to, it's to strengthen what you're saying I, I was just talking with my girlfriend talking about how yeah. um self-identification makes possible a lot of lovely stuff like love mm. yeah uh, uh, between people because obviously there's the mystic kind of love which mm-hmm. is love everything uh, but then there's the love that you can share between two identities. And that's a lovely thing. And it's only really possible through self-identifying and that other person self-identifying and you loving each other's self-identification. So th- there's lots of lovely things with self-identification and also feeling good about yourself. Uh, that's so important. And that's something that uh, uh, a lot of psychedelic users, so-called psychonauts, 
um, you don't, uh, don't spend a lot of time on, um, which is trying to feel good about yourself. Mm-hmm. That's an important factor of life for a lot of people, especially because they don't feel good about themselves. And that's just shit. Yeah. So, yeah, like- you can't even get away from it. Well, you probably can. Like, I imagine there's some monks that live in Tibet in the mountains that can probably complete, that probably don't self-identify ever, but, and mm-hmm. they've been meditating for 20 years and haven't spoken to anyone. But I don't know how, if everyone wants to do that. <laughs> I mean, I don't. Yeah. I want to expand, but I just don't, I don't want to do it to the way, like, so I love people. I love talking to people. I love, huh? I, I don't get why you'd like, you know, cut yourself off from, everyone like that because at the end of the day you should be sharing your experiences you should be sharing all the stuff you do you should be meet like-minded people like learn from others and like yeah Mm. like so I do feel that although it may seem very you know expansive it can be quite a reductive way to live yeah it does just come down to that some people are inclined to do that though like the like mystics in the past and um holy men in general uh, some people are just generally inclined to go and live in mountains and things like that uh, mm-hmm. and some people are much more social mm-hmm. it's just I, I guess it comes down to inclination um really uh mm-hmm. i get i get some holy man vibes sometimes like i sometimes i do just want to go live in the mountains but i also like people too uh, mm-hmm. i like the positive things in people i love uh <laughs> loving people and i love when people live in love it's fantastic yeah it's only the negative side the sorry the ultimate, the ultimate stage in zen is um called return to the marketplace and yeah. um, it's called there's like a poem that goes with it which is like um something like um barefooted and naked of breast uh, he comes into the marketplace, his clothes are ragged and dust laden, but he is ever blissful. Um, he uses no magic to extend his life, and before him, the dead trees come alive. So it's about like returning to society and being embroiled in life, kind of thing. And so, yeah. and like, because um, that's this thing called like the 10 stages of like enlightenment, it's like the 10 bulls, and like enlight- enlightenment, um, it's like there's like pictures that are associated with each stage, and like the eighth picture is like just a blank white circle and that's yeah. like enlightenment but then there's two stages after that which are like which one's called return to the source and one's called return to the marketplace or something and so right. i just thought i'd add that in because it's like you know it's not necessarily about going and isolating yourself on a mountain kind of thing it's yeah you, you know or if it is then you got to come back at some point yeah definitely uh I like that. It's a nice poem too, actually. A, a nice way of saying it. Um, it's it's even like pl- like what Plato was saying. You leave the cave, but you got to come back and help people. Um, just well, because, I guess, yeah. If if what you're saying is correct, then you, you there's nothing to come back to, is there? Because if if what you're saying is right, then all there is 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 yourself, isn't it? Because you're one with God, and so there isn't any world to come back to, you know. So. There's no difference. No, I mean, the people, there is the ego realm and there is the, the because you're, you're, you are self-identify. I, I couldn't, maybe it is because of the lack of the symbiosis with the mushroom or maybe it's other factors, but we self-identify and we live in social constructs. I do believe that it is your, well, no, I don't believe it's your anything, but I, I, I think that you should cut, I mean, you go, you do come back, whether it's the enlightenment, whether it's a mystic experience in any of its forms, such as a, a drug induced, a psychedelic induced mystic experience, either way, you're going to come down. And that is the metaphor of coming back to the marketplace. And when you come down, well, you're down now. It, it, that's, it's like, I like those Eastern metaphors because most of the ones that count say enlightenment is not the end. Enlightenment is just the start. And now you've got to deal with the enlightenment. And that's the truth, man. You can you can have an enlightened experience on psychedelics, or you can have an enlightened experience through other means. But if you come down and don't integrate, or don't work, or whatever, or 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 don't, or just think you're enlightened now, you miss the point. And maybe you, I don't know, man. I don't know. But 
But isn't the point that your ordinary egoic identification with the body, isn't that the hallucination? Isn't that the trip? So really, you know, when you say mm. you come down yeah, and guess. you have your yeah. ordinary experience, like maybe yeah. your ordinary experience is being feeling infinite, but then the, the ego, the egoic identification is something that you, you're doing like an activity. Yeah, that's a than... very interesting way of thinking about it. And, and if anything, if, if I mean, as a way of thinking about it, it's, it's, there's quite a truth to that, isn't there? It, it, it seems quite like an interesting idea, infinite consciousness. Well, why is it? So why does it have appear to be in bodies which self-identify well it could who knows i mean maybe it's a trip yeah it's a, a, a learning curve i don't know now we're talking about theological motivations of the of the universe which is a great conversation but i don't have answers um, maybe um i've got a little theory maybe like a trip is that kind of like you know theolo- that journey and stuff that um journey to enlightenment condensed yeah. into an extremely small period of time so the reason it's so intense is that you're experiencing the entire journey all at once maybe yeah like, uh, i've thought that other people have thought it too uh timothy leary and another geezer called richard alpert who later became known as ramdas said same thing these guys were harvard psychologists yeah. during the summer of love and they got what kicked out yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert were uh, mm-hmm. the they did the Harvard LSD experiment. They were the Harvard and that's why I got kicked out. Um, but um, they wrote a book called The Psychedelic Experience of another man called um, uh, with another man. And they the, the psychedelic experience was essentially it was about the Tibetan Book of the Dead called the Bardo Todo, and it was. Um, uh, the Tibetan the Book of the Dead is, is a book widely known in a normal reading as a book about dying and about or about how about yeah about dying but what they said it was is, is, is the Tibetan Book of the Dead is more of an esoteric with an esoteric reading it's really about a book about tripping although it wasn't about tripping through drugs through the, through the, the, the monks it was about just the, the mystical experience in general through meditation or whatever um, the thing is, though, is psychedelics definitely are that. I do think that. I think it's the mystic experience on tap. I've said it before. I, f- I think that's what it is. It, 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 at least one where you have a mystic experience. It's a mystic experience right there in, in a six hours on shrooms or 12 hours on acid or 10 minutes on DMT. Um, either way, though, it's a mystic experience. And, yeah, you get the whole trip. You, you even come down and return to the marketplace afterwards. You get the whole trip. And it, the thing is, though, is it can be uh, a lot of people miss the trip because it's so quick and, and or they, 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 they didn't even know that was a trip or, you know, they, they didn't know it was an enlightenment trip. They just thought it was a heart oh, taking a drug trip or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, but I do think it is the mystic experience trip. It's the it's that. But then like what Harry just said, though, it's very interesting. Maybe this maybe life is the trip. And then when you take drugs, it's or have a mystic experience in general. It's like dipping back into what you actually are all the time, which is actually interesting. I think that's what that's kind of what it seems like, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Which is I'm not sure. Cool. Yeah. I'm not sure I was suggesting that like life. Um, when I was talking about enlightenment and stuff, I wasn't. I didn't mean like a blind and white light or whatever. I just meant like realizing that you're all just infinite consciousness. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that's getting into my my ideas or whatever. But I just meant like. Because the return to the, the return to the marketplace, I'm not sure it's like a, a, it means like a return to like ordinary ways of thinking of thinking of oneself no, as a separate self. You it's couldn't. more about like this. yeah, yeah. It's like, so, sorry. If, if all there is is yourself, then the implications of that is that there isn't any any world to come back to. So it's not that you only gain union with God when you're in the ashram, when you're in silent meditation or when you're on a five grams of mushrooms with a blindfold on. It's that even when you're in the middle of a marketplace, if you are truly one with God, then there isn't yeah. anything there other than yourself for you to come into contact with really. So there's no yeah. difference between being in total isolation and being in the middle of a marketplace. Mm. And I, 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 it's, it's good because I, I would say that that is one of the, that's one of the reasons why I prolong spiritual practice is needed you, uh, you you can't just take psychedelics because the thing about psychedelics is 
it's not it's not uh, it's not how they mean going back to the marketplace you, you're right it's, it's you come back and you have a fully developed ego uh, when you calm down your psychedelics um if but when you have a prolonged spiritual practice which you integrate your whole life to when they mean coming back to the marketplace it's after as you say you are able to not identify with yourself and others it's more like you're just swimming in line and all the time yeah um spirituality is better than drugs and by a million times but drugs are accessible and you can do them now and, and it's a good introduction i think for a lot of people you know mm-hmm. like, but obviously you shouldn't do drugs so we don't condone that law of course not. <laughs> i'm not sure we've quite established that i'm not sure we've you know said that quite enough though i think we could say yeah bit. yeah but i do think that um no. Yeah, spirituality. Um, the thing is, um, <clears throat> let's say I feel psychedelics is more of a gateway, not a gateway, yeah, but like it shatters. Um, cause one of the blocks to spirituality is the ego, and I feel that you know psychedelics are something that just cuts off, you know, that mental block towards spirituality. Yeah. At the end yeah. of the day, yeah, it's a it's a great way. I mean, the thing is, as I was saying this to you before the podcast. Um, I before psychedelic as a completely different geezer, uh, the mm. reductionist, materialist, atheist. Like I said, I can't even really remember how I thought, but that's how I thought more or less. And I was completely averse to spirituality, completely averse to religion, ideas or notions of mysticism, God or anything like mm. that. So th- you can take someone like 18 year old Rob, mm-hmm. give him an acid trip and turn him on to spirituality i think that's great because mm-hmm. 18 year old rob free acid would uh i'm not being i'm not kidding i would have laughed at people uh, who said they were spiritual and meditating and things i was what a load of rubbish what are you talking about man you know yeah, uh, yeah. so you can take geezer like him mm-hmm. give dose him on a drug and set him on the path to righteousness i think that's a good thing <laughs> I'm just picturing 18-year-old Rob, 18-year-old Harry and 18-year-old Alan just watching this podcast and stuff and just yeah. laughing at it. Well, hopefully the thing about drugs, yes, they're, good, they're great psychedelics, is that they do appeal enticing, especially when you yeah. feel, see how like we're talking about it with mm-hmm. such a passion. I hope people, although obviously they're illegal and yeah. you shouldn't break the law, mm-hmm. but I, I hope it seems interesting to people yes. with, with the fever that we're talking about it because it like, as you say it's a door and then at the end of or afterwards hopefully it can help you want to be a better person and actually make the effort to be a better person so yeah certainly that might be a good note to end it on do you think or, or have we got any more topics to cover no I think that's it that's a good note I've, I've, I've got to start working 15 yeah. minutes now I think you can always do a part two as well. Yeah, sounds good to me. Yeah, like um, I'm not sure when, but we will, you know, find a time or whatever that we can always yeah. do. We can always discuss this more because it's just such a broad topic. So many different experiences, yeah. so many different like studies. Now, exactly. I don't think we there's some stuff we haven't even really touched or we only touched like you know slightly on. Yes, yeah. like delirious. Like yeah, I don't yeah. know if they really interest you or not, but like you know. That's just something that could be touched on in the future. Multiple avenues. Mm-hmm. Um, we could even do one just more talking on the the because some people are really most people I've spoke to just want to see the proof and things like that. So we can talk about the psychotherapy side of things because that's just phenomenal what's coming out with the research there. But yeah, there's lots of multiple avenues that we could talk yeah. about in the future. It's tons. It's a mm-hmm. wealth of of the subject matter, isn't it? Really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm happy. Anyway, Rob, it's been so That's good nice. to have you on. You know, like I'd love to have you back on some other time and maybe even a bit of psychedelic discussion. My pleasure. I'd I'd happy to be back. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. So um, peace out. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. How's cheers? Um, cheers. Yeah. yeah.